morning. After the 2016 election, we were shocked and distraught. Our party was now in its deepest electoral hole in perhaps a century. We cried, we commiserated, we ate a lot of junk food. And then we turned to the burning question. What the hell did Democrats miss? This question wasn't just about one horrible election. We had already lost majorities in the House, the Senate, governorships, and state houses. So to answer it, we got out of our offices in DC and we traveled. We traveled to red, purple, and blue places. We did not bring a pollster. We didn't do traditional focus groups. We listened, listened deeply to people ourselves in Denny's, church basements, and union halls. And we asked them basic questions about their lives, their anxieties, and their aspirations. We listened to hundreds of people in a dozen states, and we heard a lot. We heard threads and common themes, but equally notable were the things we did not hear. We heard almost nothing about income inequality, even though Democrats have talked about it a lot over the years. It's obviously a serious economic and moral challenge. So we wondered, why? Why were so few people bringing it up in our travels? Then we realized something profound. Income inequality is not something most Americans see, except maybe on TV. In certain very deep blue places, the ultra wealthy are all around you. There are over 8,000 households in New York City that are worth more than $30 million. But there are the same number, the same number of ultra wealthy people here. For most Americans, billionaires and millionaires are not next door and are not part of their lived experience. By contrast, this is their lived experience. When we were on the road, we heard over and over again that their number one fear was that they and their kids would not be able to earn a good life. They worried that there would not be enough good jobs. They worried about getting the skills they needed. They worried about getting decent benefits from their work. We heard variations on this theme in cities, suburbs, and towns north, south, east, and west, huge, roiling anxiety about earning their way in the new economy. So how did so many of us, third way included, miss this? I think, I think it's because the Great Recession actually obscured this crisis of opportunity. Democrats did the right thing and tried to ease the immediate pain and avoid a depression. But what looked cyclical was in fact structural. Americans' ability to earn a good life has been eroding steadily. I want to pause for a moment on the word earn. It is a crucial concept here. Pew conducts a worldwide survey asking people about the value of hard work. Is hard work an essential element to getting ahead, they ask. In France, only 25% say working hard is important. So to be very clear, what we're proposing and discussing here will not work in France. <laughs> in the United States, 73%. This is core core to who we are and what Americans see slipping away. That's what we heard in our visits. 
Americans want a real shot at earning a good life. So, many of them went with the guy they thought could get them there. Trump and Trumpism are divisive, dishonest, and dangerous. But we cannot afford to ignore the reality. Restoring the opportunity to earn was a central promise of his pitch. He got the question right, but he got the answer appallingly wrong. Rejecting the future, splitting the nation apart, and offering only a path backwards. That means to beat Trump and Trumpism in DC and state houses. Democrats must offer a compelling and modern alternative vision. We're gathered here to focus on that vision in which Democrats offer everyone, everywhere, the opportunity to earn a good life. Imagine, imagine if that is what most Americans thought Democrats were fighting for every single day. So that's what we're going to explore here in Columbus. What it could mean if we became opportunity Democrats. Sarah described the digital age economy and some trends and challenges. I'm going to build off that. First, by dissecting the crisis of opportunity. Second, I'll offer the outlines of what a bold, inclusive, modern opportunity agenda could look like. Finally, I'll provide a quick roadmap of our time in Columbus. So let's talk about the crisis of opportunity, starting with jobs. As Sarah pointed out, work is not ending. We've added 37 million jobs since 1993, when Microsoft Windows kicked off the digital age. There are 6.7 million job openings at this very moment. But we must not be fooled. There is a lot of pain, angst, uncertainty, and disruption underneath these numbers. Let me show you. From 2005 to 2015, America added 150,000 net new businesses. That sounds pretty great, right? Over that decade, a thousand counties gained new businesses, the ones in green. But in the other 2,100 counties, the yellow ones, the number of businesses fell, and they fell a lot. They lost 200,000 businesses, and with them went more than a million private sector jobs. These yellow counties represent the diversity of America, urban, rural, suburban, minority, and white. If you live in one of these counties, opportunity is vanishing right before your eyes. And here is the political reality. Trump won these yellow counties by three and a half million votes. But it wasn't always this way. This is the same map but from the decade prior, 1995 to 2005, it is a lush field of green, of counties gaining businesses and jobs. That was most Americans' lived experience a decade ago. That change from green to yellow, that's what an opportunity crisis looks like. So what is happening that is causing this opportunity crisis? There are many culprits when it comes to jobs. Automation, trade, overregulation, monopolies, and scant federal investment in basic research. But one main driver that is often overlooked is access to capital, the lifeblood of business. Capital has become way, way too difficult for most folks to get. Bank lending to small business is way down, well below its 2008 peak. Lending in rural areas is below levels of two decades ago. 
And then there is VC funding, which is essential to turning ideas into companies. Three states get 75% of all the VC funding in the country. Three states. So the capital you need to start and grow a business is concentrated geographically and by business size. It's even worse demographically. These are the startups who got venture funding in 2015 by demography. Look at these numbers. Really look at them. This is a moral outrage, and it is economically idiotic. Does anyone, anyone in this room believe that not a single black-owned startup had an investment-worthy idea? That there were just two dozen Hispanic entrepreneurs and less than 150 women worthy of funding? That's insane and wrong. It is painful to think about the number of doors we are slamming shut on so many potentially great entrepreneurs. No wonder startups, historically the biggest creator of new jobs, are down. No wonder so many businesses in so many counties lost businesses. Forty years ago, 16% of all businesses were startups. Four years ago, it was 8%, cut in half. That's not progress. What does all this add up to? A lot less opportunity for people to earn a good life. Let's move to the education and skills you need to get and keep good jobs. So you're 18. You've just finished high school. There are two paths, college or work. College seems promising, and each year about two million high school grads choose the path of a two or four year college. Do you know how many of them will never, never get a degree? Half, half. If a high school had this completion rate, we'd shut it down. Why should we let colleges continue to rip off our kids and our families like this? You pay tuition, probably go into debt, and no degree. What does that do to opportunity? What about the path for those who don't go to college? This chart shows the number of skilled workers and corresponding jobs. For low-skilled jobs, we have more workers than jobs. Then there are middle skill jobs. These do not require a four-year degree, but do require some training after high school. We have a huge shortfall of middle skill workers. So there is a ton of opportunity here for people. If, if our track record of training people for these jobs wasn't so abysmal, take apprenticeships. They are awesome. You earn while you learn, and you get certified, often by a union. But they're an afterthought. We have only 64,000 registered apprenticeships a year. If apprenticeships were as available in the United States as they are, say, in Switzerland, we would have 1.3 million more workers getting trained for middle skill jobs every single year. Mid-career training, also pretty grim. Only 20% of workers get training where they work. Trade adjustment assistance, a marquee government training program for workers, is tiny. Only 25,000 people get training through TAA every year. That's a joke. So there are not enough good jobs it's hard to get the right skills. What about the pay and benefits that are supposed to come with hard work? As we all know, and Sarah described, wages are flat for most Americans. On top of that, we have policies for a leave it to beaver world when we live in a modern family nation. Only 14% of workers have paid family leave through their job and only 6% have access 
to a flexible schedule arrangement. Obamacare, which we fought for passionately with many of you, made health care available to all. But most are still worried about cost and quality. How about retirement? Only half of the workforce has a retirement account on top of Social Security. For low-income workers, it's one in 10. So there it is, a snapshot of a deeply anxious country. And who can blame them? Two-thirds of counties shedding businesses, risk capital concentrated in too few places and people, lending down, startups down, shockingly low college completion rates, few skills paths for non-college grads, and a workplace benefit structure from a madman era. All this while our economy changes at light speed. No surprise, people are pissed, upset, and doing radical things at the ballot box. This opportunity crisis is depressing, daunting, and damning. But, but, we have been here before, and we came out of it stronger and better. 100 years ago, we went from an agrarian to an industrial economy. It created massive upheaval, but we figured it out and worked to mend, not end capitalism. We forged an industrial era social contract that created a middle class that became the envy of the entire world. Today, we need a new social contract, one built for a digital global age. What do I mean by a new social contract? It must still rely on the private sector to generate shared national prosperity, but it must recognize that the market alone will not deliver nearly enough opportunity to nearly enough Americans. Once again, the time has come to mend, but not end, capitalism for a new era. And we need a modern opportunity agenda to do just that. It must reimagine government investment in good paying jobs, reinvent skill acquisition, and radically redesign the benefits of work. The ideas that underlie these three themes must be big. Tinkering will not solve this opportunity crisis or regain majorities. So our ideas must be bold, but they must fit the age we are in. Big isn't enough. If it is bold and old, it is simply old. Third way is proposed our own big ideas that could form the foundation of a modern opportunity agenda for Democrats. And there are many fantastic ideas from the New Deal, the New Dems, the Economic Innovation Group, Brookings, and many, many more. I'm gonna touch on just a few of ours. To reimagine investment in good paying jobs, what if we created a bank for Main Street, not Wall Street? It would make risk capital and loans available to millions more entrepreneurs. Last century, we created the Federal Reserve and the Export-Import Bank. This century, let's forge an American investment bank. 60 years ago, we launched the Peace Corps. What if in this century, we designed a Boomer Corps? Millions of seniors could work part-time in a national service program to benefit our country. They could earn tax-free on top of Social Security while helping younger generations. To reinvent education after high school, what if we built Apprenticeship America? Every state would have a flagship apprenticeship institute. Instead of having a handful of apprenticeships, we would have a million a year. Last century, we built the world's best system of universities. 
Now we should set up an apprenticeship system every bit as robust as our public universities. In the 20th century, we started unemployment insurance. What if we reinvented UI and turned it into re-employment insurance? Everyone laid off will get the same income support as UI now gives, plus skills training and help moving if that's what you want. And we must redesign benefits for today's job hopping, uncertain economy. What if we built on last century's EITC with a permanent working wage break? That would mean no, no federal taxes on the first 15,000 earned by everyone in the working and middle class without touching your Social Security benefits. In the 20th century, we started Social Security so the elderly wouldn't live in poverty. In the 21st, what if everyone who worked also had a universal private retirement account, like a federal thrift savings plan, so the elderly can live in comfort? We'd have employers chip in at least 50 cents an hour, it would be simple and portable, and it would give everyone a stake in our capital markets and a retirement befitting a lifetime of work. Big, new, modern, relentlessly focused on restoring the opportunity to earn. That must be our compass. We must upend the status quo and become opportunity Democrats who champion the next generation of transformational ideas. So let's put it all together. What could it mean to be opportunity Democrats? It means we focus mainly on the crisis of opportunity caused by globalization and the digital revolution, not income inequality caused by a rigged system. It means we seek to connect with people's core values, starting with the value of hard work, earning that good life, not getting things for free. It means we fight for ideas that are bold and big and modern. We define and own the future. Let's be clear. 80s supply side, 90s centrism, and 60s socialism will not cut it for the era we're in. We need something new and different. This party and this country need opportunity Democrats. And that is precisely what the next day and a half will be all about. You'll hear from practitioners and political leaders, intellectuals and operatives. You hear about what works, what doesn't, and what people really want. For the rest of this morning, we'll continue to explore the perils and promises of this new economic era. At lunch, we'll talk about politicking in the digital age, using technology to revolutionize how we run campaigns. Then we get to the heart of this event, hearing from you. In the strategy sessions this afternoon, we'll gather your insights and ideas as we discuss big issues facing our party. We'll have a fun reception tonight, and tomorrow we'll put it all together in the form that matters greatly to everyone here, running and governing as Opportunity Democrats. We'll hear from some of the most thoughtful Democratic leaders and from some of the inspiring new faces who've been moved to run for the first time. All of them have seen the opportunity crisis up close and are working to navigate the political and policy implications in real time. Why? Why must our party move in a new direction and become opportunity Democrats. Because it is necessary to save the working and middle class in the century ahead. Because this is how we help bind up a social fabric that is being torn to shreds. Because this is the way we defeat Trump and Trumpism in 2020 and beyond. This will regain our majorities and retake our country. Thank you.